So, um, we'll have a, a few rules here. If I uh, make a noise, it means I want you to stop and we'll move it on because, um, uh, yeah, this could get quite heated. We've only got like 15 minutes. I'll try and be fair to all, get the most important questions in the way. I am a Bitcoiner. I'll try and be impartial. I've brought some lipstick to put on the pig. So, uh, <laughs> if I win the argument, you have to wear this. And <laughs> If you don't. Right. Anyway, um, very quick introduction to yourself. Dan, you've already introduced yourself, so you don't need to do yourself. Uh, Alex, you've already, uh, people have met you. And uh, Michelle, can you just introduce yourself? Um, I introduced myself as well, but yeah. <laughs> I'm a cryptocurrency researcher at the University of Cambridge. Sorry, I was out of the room when you were not doing that. Okay. <laughs> Dan, is Bitcoin's proof of work efficient? Yes. Yes. Can you guys hear me? There we go. As demonstrated before, we have to evaluate Bitcoin's energy usage relative to every other monetary system. I think it harnesses electricity in a more explicit fashion that's easy to calculate, calculating the existing financial system and the gold mining monetary systems in terms of the energy needed to move it around is less explicit, therefore people, it's less transparent and people feel that Bitcoin looks to be inefficient. Bitcoin, in, its, in the essence of its nature, is most efficient because it takes pure electricity and converts that to protect the network and mine new Bitcoins. Okay, thank you. Alex, when you looked at the number of transactions, did you consider in part of that that the amount of transactions uh, on-chain doesn't reflect the real usage of Bitcoin, and really the base chain is used to uh, secure the network, but actually a whole lot of activity happens on the Lightning Network, on side chains, and in custodial solutions, but we require the security to protect the base chain. Well, first a, a little note about usage. So uh, one thing I saw coming by was a, a little um, research from Chain Analysis, and they found that 1% um, of Bitcoin transactions is designated for um, merchants, and the rest is just um, going around at exchanges, which is not really economically meaningful if you're just moving your money around. That's uh, price discovery. <laughs> and, and, and actually, like, no, no one can use gold at any single merchant in the, the whole world. There's no gold. There's no merchant in Bavaria that accepts gold for payment. But gold is very valuable. It's a store of value. That's what Bitcoin does. Bitcoin isn't a cheap PayPal. Michelle, good chance for you to interject here. Can you tell everyone the work you've been doing, uh, the research, and what you found? Yeah, so for example, we produced that mining map uh, that you showed before. Yeah. So the thing is we reach out to miners in the space um, and we identified 128 different facilities, so either through survey data, calling them and verifying everything, public information. But even that only covers around 10 to 20% maybe of the entire um, essentially mining activities going on. So it's very, very difficult to actually get to the, the actual facilities. And so when we talk about energy consumption, that's one thing, but the environmental footprint, uh, you actually need to take into account the energy mix that's being used. And that if you don't know where the facilities are, and I agree with you that uh, renewables are not that magic bullet either because of the intermittent nature, um, which makes it very difficult. So if you want to try to say whether the costs associated with it, so especially environmental costs are worth it, then we need to do a cost-benefit analysis. The problem is, it's already difficult to estimate the costs, but it's almost impossible to really put a number on the benefits, because people use it in a contextual way, which changes from one you know, individual to another, so you can't really put a number to that. Bitcoin moves $1.3 trillion annually. It's a, it's a protocol created by a pseudonymous founder, run in a decentralized manner to move $1.3 trillion across the world, where anyone can move their Bitcoin without permission. That's pretty valuable. Alex, do you believe Bitcoin has any value? Um, one Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin, right? But do you, do you believe in Bitcoin? Do you not believe in Bitcoin? Do you have a personal uh, view on Bitcoin? Oh, sure, yeah. My, um, I'm actually generally quite positive toward Bitcoin. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, which may be hard to believe, but in general, I do like the technology. I like the fact that it gives you the option to at least do transactions without going to a financial intermediary, which is something we haven't had before. Uh, it's just that, in my opinion, it's not worth the cost that it has in Bitcoin. Do you, have you spent any other time evaluating the cost uh, and use of energy against other 
uh, say, gold mining against fiat? Have you done like-for-like -like comparisons <laughs> rather than just per transaction, the actual total cost per industry? Yeah, so I looked at the uh, comparison with um, gold mining. I already showed a number there. Um, whereas at the moment, um, relatively, Bitcoin is eight times uh, less efficient than mining gold. Uh, per one Bitcoin mine of gold, per dollar mine of gold, is whatever uh, expression you want to use over there. Um, although, uh, in essence, uh, Bitcoin mining, gold mining remains fundamentally a bit difficult to compare because in gold, you're, you don't put your gold back into the ground and mine it again, whereas if you have transaction fees, that's coins that have already been mined before. You're not remining the same coin. Well, you talk about transaction fees. Yeah. Yeah. So have you looked at the total energy consumption for the gold industry? Uh, yes, I have. So how does it compare? In total, it's obviously going to be, it's about half at the moment. It's about half. Yeah. Half of what Bitcoin is. Yeah. And the total, say, for fiat, so people understand the kind of... Sorry? The, 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 say, the total for the uh, fiat system... It uh, depends on what you include, because um, I think it's unfair to just compare Bitcoin to the fiat system as a whole, because in Bitcoin, there's also an ecosystem evolving with in exchanges, um, with, with, well, I've been to some uh, local places where they, um, like the Coin House in Paris and other places like that, uh, there's Bitcoin ADMs. Um, if Bitcoin grows to let's say, the size of the current financial system. Um, we might need a few less offices here and there, but it's still very much the question what's going to be the difference to that. And so what I looked at primarily was what's the difference in terms of processing capacity? And that's why I was primarily looking at data center energy use and trying to look at, okay, how much of that, that is used. That's not fair, though. I mean, uh, data center processing is just one of many costs of the existing financial system. Uh, yeah. The physical creation of the buildings and the entire lifetimes of people who live and work in the financial industry, it's entire lives, you have to feed them with energy in the buildings they live in, the cars they live in. And then you have the payment processing terminals as well. And then you have the handling of cash. You have banks, you have vaults, you have ATMs, like enormous amounts of energy. The comparison, well, in total, the uh, amount of energy used by the banking industry, including branches and all that stuff, uh, I think it was estimated at around 650 terawatt hours. That's one estimate that somebody did maybe four years ago. So not the most, um, let's say, established number. Um, and Bitcoin would be doing one-tenth of that at the moment, although obviously the size difference is still humongous, 500 billion transactions, not, in, not including fee, uh, cash, by the way. I'm being generous, too. We're not including the military or the courts or the political system, which enforces the monetary policy and enforces the monetary system. I'm, ooh, I'm, ooh. I'm not sure we won't be having a military anymore if you're all running Bitcoin. Dan, um, well, even I think we can all <laughs> agree that we can't compare the two things. No, they're very so, hard to compare. I well, agree. this is the key agree. point, because yeah. we, we, we're trying to compare things which aren't comparable, um, yeah. and sure. everything's relative. Dan, I am, as a Bitcoiner, big, big Bitcoin fan, obviously, I am also concerned about energy usage. You know, I see these charts, and I do think there must be a better way, you know, for us to potentially be using the same amount of power as China to secure the network. So I ask the question, the network is secure now. The incentives for miners and the, the incentive in the market is for more ASICs to be produced, more people to be mining because of the, uh, uh, the uh, rewards from the block subsidy and mining fees. But is there a better way and how much security is enough? So proof of work solves something that previously uh, was solved through a similar proof-of-stake system. So proof-of-stake is an old technology. It's more of political, a sort of a political mechanism, whereas proof-of-work is using something fundamental, which is about physics. Proof-of-work, there is no way to shortcut proof-of-work. You have to expend the energy. There's no shortcut. There's no, there's no way to get around it within the realm of physics. Proof-of-stake has political attack vectors that are still undiscovered. Proof-of-stake is untested. It's also something that's from the legacy system and has numerous different like gaping holes in its potential capabilities. Now, is it interesting? Sure. Does it work? We're not sure yet. And will, are we willing to try something that is not rooted in physics? We can. 
but it is less secure than Bitcoin and will always be less secure than it. Uh, to highlight the environmental concern, I'm a huge environmentalist. I love the earth, I love hiking. I like to reduce as much consumption as I have. I have low time preference for the Bitcoiners out there. Reducing my current consumption and saving my money. By reducing my consumption, I like to increase the number of available goods and services to everyone here now. I believe in a minimalist philosophy in life. So I would love to be as minimal as possible, but Bitcoin takes the most minimal amount of energy possible to prove the work that is necessary to, to protect the network. So I, I think there's been a lot of systems that have been tried. I think Bitcoin does it extremely efficiently. Michelle, do the benefits of Bitcoin outweigh the cost? Well, as I just said before, there's absolutely no way of actually quantifying the benefits because they are contextual. Um, so every individual using it for a different thing may derive a different utility from it. Um, and if you aggregate all of that together, it would be great, but you just don't, you can't do that bottom-up analysis. Which then also means that if you want to compare it again, Visa transactions, as you said just before, um, you can compare it to go digital gold, right? It can be used as a payment method, it can be used as a censorship-resistant uh, way of transferring value. So you need to take these things into account as well. And one thing I think that hasn't even been mentioned today is Bitcoin's used as a public notary, mm -hmm. so that you can actually notarize billions of data points in one single transaction. And uh, that is a use case that I think will definitely be very important in the future. So if you take all these things into account, um, then what exactly are you compare it to? It's something completely new that encompasses all of these different uses. Well, I fully agree that it depends on the person. Look, if you are if you are living over here in in Germany, and you want to send money to the other side of the ocean, and you can choose between using Visa or you can use Bitcoin, well, then you probably don't have much of an issue going through Visa. So. Um, why would you use a system that has a footprint like Bitcoin has? But um, consider being in... To avoid bank fees. So I, it, I invoice all my clients in the US and save 3.2% uh, surcharge on uh, exchange rate fees. So there you go. If that's, a, that's based, I should probably save... That could be saving around $15,000 next year. So how was that going during the 2017 bubble? Bubble was irrelevant. I... I, I invoice and I immediately cash in. But well, I, the, the I, avoid, I avoid country to country um, yeah. exchange rate fees. So there is a use case there that of Bitcoin over Visa. I just wanted to uh, point out the uh, transaction fees kind of exploded at the time, which is actually probably good from a developer perspective. But you can play the transaction fees. You can, you can time your transaction. That's only if you want immediate settlement. Yeah, and run the risk that your transaction doesn't get processed until... Yeah, you, I, yeah. I mean... I, it's always kind of sorry. I don't mean to pick on you as an independent <laughs> neutral moderator, but the the <laughs> the one the essentially one month of very high fees over a ten over ten year lifespan of a protocol uh, when it gets used as an argument is kind of it's a little bit weak it's because a bit cherry picking. Yeah, I mean, I'm not having that. Well, that's that's the direction so, where it's so, going, right? I like mean, somebody moved. What was it the other day? Somebody moved 240 million for th about three dollars. Yeah, to be clear, transaction fees on layer one are based on bytes, so the the size of the transaction in bytes, the data size. Transactions on layer two, which is Lightning, are based on the size of the value that you're moving. So everyone kind of knows. Yeah. So um, it's not that I don't appreciate your points. So I have a concern over the um, the energy usage, but. There are definite use cases of Bitcoin over Visa uh, or MasterCard or bank to bank. It's usually over international borders. Yeah, sure. But just what I was pointing out is that in the end, the block, subsidy, the block subsidies is going to zero in the long run. Uh, the network will be more dependent on transaction fees. Uh, and then it's going to matter a whole lot more, obviously. And the process takes 120 years. But wait, let's take actually a step back. Why are we using clear. proof of work, right? <laughs> It's so I, I think I was originally trying to say something about Venezuela because I was trying to get into something positive. Okay, no, let's go. Let's go Venezuela. <laughs> I know a lot about it. Um, yeah, because in, in Venezuela, if you have no banking system or the banking system has completely lost your faith, then you might actually think, okay, Bitcoin is not that bad or it's the only option I have. So yeah, I'll definitely use it. And it offers a, a, a means when there is no means, although I have to add, obviously, in Venezuela... Um, at some point, they started having power outages, and then Bitcoin is not useful anymore either. Which means that neither is the existing banking system. Well, obviously. But and actually, Bitcoin works with satellites and radio, so, yeah. 
Yeah, you don't you don't want to have Bitcoin miners around when you're running short on energy. You don't want to have fiat where you can't get it out of the ATM because the ATM doesn't have electricity. So, so in any case, the, in Venezuela, they would definitely have a more positive view towards um, Bitcoin, even if the costs are the energy costs are that high. Depends on the person. Yeah. Um, that went really quickly. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about Venezuela, I've done three interviews with people who look, uh, live there, work there, or work with people there, and trying to un uh, discover how uh, the financial system's working. It's, it's really uh, interesting stuff. Uh, learn a lot about that. Uh, round of applause for the guests. <laughs>